It's Thursday, June 23rd, and you're listening to the Geek News Central Podcast, sponsored by GoDaddy.com. Geek News Central is a problem of the tech podcast network. Everyone got a great show lined up for you. Yes, I am on the road. I am here in Washington, D.C. Got a lot to talk about. You know what comes next. Strap in. Here it comes. Coming to you from a dimly lit hotel room with bad Wi-Fi and not enough power outlets, here's everyone's favorite jet-lagged geek, Todd Cochran. Aloha and w- oh, that was nice. Need to push the right button. Hey, aloha and welcome to the Geek News Central podcast, coming to you as live as it can be from the nation's capital via the Geek News Central portable studio. Everyone, welcome to the show. My name is Todd Cochran. Of course, I encourage you to get over to geeknewscentral.com. Check out all the great content over there. Of course, check our archive podcast out available via the podcast link. Well, lots going on. Last show on the road. I tell you, I, it seems like I've been uh, traveling forever. Uh, this is the uh, fourth show in a row for the Geek News Central podcast on the road. Of course, we did do the Saturday morning tech show last week in uh, in Honolulu, but I am absolutely unequivocally ready to uh, to go home and be home in the studio there in Honolulu, uh, putting the show on there. Lots going on, and just an update for all of you that had uh, basically reached out and said they wanted to do a meetup in Washington, D.C. Friday night. Um, essentially what's going on is I, my schedule has kind of uh, finished up a little bit early here, so what I'm going to be doing is uh, tonight after the uh, after the show, I'm going to be packing up and uh, heading down to see my sister in Chesapeake, Virginia, which is just south of, uh, of Norfolk. She's about two and a half hours away, and uh, go down there and see her. I have not seen her or my uh, niece and nephews for a couple of years, and this particular trip uh, it really is uh, you know, basically going to let me uh, go down there and spend a day with them. And then I won't get back into the D.C. area late, late, late um, Friday night. And then I have a very early, I have to be at uh, Dulles at 4 o'clock in the morning uh, for a 5.30 flight back to uh, back to Honolulu. But uh, no Saturday morning tech show, obviously, because I'll be airborne when that show would normally air. So uh, this is the uh, the last show this week, of at least of Geek New Central, until we're back with you on Tuesday. Of course, the Gadget Professor will have a new show out, or he may have already uh, published it. I haven't even looked on the website to see if it's uh, been pushed out, but the Gadget Professor will have a, a show for you today. And, of course, on uh, Monday, you'll have Robot Underpants. There'll be a new show out as well. So uh, I'm going to go down there and hang out with her and see the kids and my brother-in-law and and uh, spend a little bit of time with them, so I'm pretty excited about doing that. But I've had a very, very uh, full week here in uh, in D.C., uh, meeting with clients. Uh, I've been putting in some really massive hours, to be honest with you, from a time perspective. So um, pretty wiped at this point. And a matter of fact, uh, the bed over there in the hotel room is, is looking awfully good. And uh, but I got to get the show done and get it packed, get everything packed up so I can uh, I can get out of here. But uh, I want to give a warm welcome to all of the Hana, all of the longtime listeners of the show. Thanks for being here and being part of the family. If you're new to the show, make sure you get subscribed. You can do that via Geek News Central. You'll find links on there for iTunes, Zoom Marketplace, or standard RSS feed. However, you're um, downloading the show. And uh, of course, you know again, if you're new, sign up for the newsletter. The newsletter contains everything I'm going to cover tonight on the tech side. It'll be stuff that you've submitted as well. If you have comments for today's show, geeknews at gmail.com. The voicemail hotline is 619-342-7365. Got a few things I want to talk to you about, but first of all, number one is our GoDaddy deals are going fast. Our GoDaddy deal number one, our special deal that has been on just a little less than seven days where you would get a free .info uh, with a seven dollar and forty nine cents purchase of a dot com is gone. That do, that deal is gone, done, over with. Matter of fact, I've got to get the banner out of rotation on the website. I'll do that after the show tonight. But that free dot info uh, with a dot com purchase is no longer. Those have flew off the shelf, and uh, 
I got informed this morning by GoDaddy that uh, that offer is closed. But our GoDaddy number two, where you can get a .co domain for $10.99, is still on by using the promo code GEEK and June, Geek June. Of course, our GoDaddy number three deal is going to be good until the end of the month is a free private registration, which is a $9.99 value when you register or transfer one or domains. There's no limits on this. So get as many free private registrations as you uh, basically can can put into the system between now and the end of the month. And that's geek free is the promo code. Want to say congratulations to my GoDaddy rep. Uh, she is uh, getting ready to go out on maternity leave. And uh, so she's going to be out for uh, seven to 10 weeks. We wish her the best and uh, and her husband as well. As well, I want to give a hearty congratulations to uh, Cameron, uh, one of our junior developers at Raw Voice. He is uh, getting married this weekend, and his lovely bride and him are headed off to a destination that I am not allowed to talk about. <laughs> so he's got a secret honeymoon location that they're going to the Caribbean. So he'll be out for, I, I think, 10 days or so. And... Uh, I want to give a hearty congratulations to to Cameron. And, boy, lots of stuff going on with the Raw Voice family as well. Uh, Angelo Mandato, our lead developer at Raw Voice, him and his wife are expecting their second child. And she is uh, due any day. So uh, they've got a bag packed, and he's been back in the car in the driveway and uh, keeping his cell phone close. So uh, uh, our family is expanding at Raw Voice. We're going to have new uh, new family members here soon. So I'm excited about that. But uh, summertime is vacation time, and uh, I'm going to be headed home to take care of the kids while my wife uh, jumps over to Japan for a couple of weeks to see her ailing father. So lots going on in the Ohana space, in the family space here. But uh, other than that, uh, things are going good, and uh, I'm very, very uh, uh, pleased on basically where we're moving forward with it as a business. Hey, of course, again, uh, thanks for GoDaddy for being a sponsor here, and, and you can definitely take a uh, peek at all my promo codes at geeknocenter.com forward slash GoDaddy. You know, one thing I've been dealing with over the last uh, couple of days is when we started Raw Voice as a business, and, you know, I talk about the business side here once in a while, and, um, you know, Geek New Central is my own company, uh, the folks that uh, produce their shows at Geek New Central are part of my family here at, uh, at Geek New Central. But, you know, Raw Voice, we represent about 9,000 media creators now. And all of those media creators have basically, when they signed up for our service, agreed to a terms of service that uh, basically um, is designed to protect them and to protect um, our business. And part of the um, part of those terms are some anti-compete clauses. You guys know that I have a variety of sponsors here at Geek New Central. We have a variety of sponsors that uh, work with us at Raw Voice, and really, we've worked a long time to establish those relationships. So, anytime a content creator wants to leave, and you know they are free to do so, we remind them that they are bound by their one-year anti-compete clause, where they can't go and basically do advertising deals with vendors that we already have relationships with for about a year. And just seems like this week it's been one thing after the other. A few shows are, are not real happy with me and us basically saying, hey, uh, you know, you get peers that you're um, soliciting advertising from a vendor that we have a relationship with. You know that we have an anti-compete clause. And, um, you know, they, and people are, are pretty um, unwilling to honor their legal commitments. And it really, uh, it is discerning. And especially when we work hard to get people exposure on devices like the Roku and the Boxy, um, and a variety of other uh, platforms through our initiatives and developing applications and so forth. And we do you know a lot of work helping them with statistics and promotion and giving them great tools. And yet, uh, when they decide they've grown up enough and they want to go off and do their own thing, which is fine with us, um, they don't want to, you know, play by the rules. So it's been one of those kind of a weeks, and uh, I really hate, i be honest with you, I really hate being like this, uh, you know, for a better word, uh, you know, be, it, be pretty hard on people. And uh, it seems like people, things would just work easier if people could understand that, uh, you know, that they made a commitment and they should hold to that. 
but uh, it's been an interesting week from that standpoint. So, you know, I guess if you're a content crea creator out there, respect those that you work with and, um, you know, understand your your obligations. And, you know, that's the main thing. You know, I like to tell people we are very easy to work with. I mean, very, very easy. And um, there's not, uh, you know, too many things that we'll do that, we, you know, that we get get upset about. And, but it is, this is one of those things where we have to protect our model, and uh, it's been a week of uh, dealing with uh, a, a couple of shows primarily that we've uh, had to say, no, 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 you, you can't do that. And I'm going to be very firm in, how should I say it, uh, protecting that as well. So uh, you have to, you have to protect your business model. But um, anyway, that's kind of what's going on. I've talked about that enough. Uh, again, fly home on Saturday, and... Uh, Look forward to uh, spending some time with my sister tomorrow, so that all is going to be good. But anyway, let us uh, let me talk here a little bit more business, and we'll get into tech. Um, the portable studio this week, kind of interesting, um, using Wirecast. Definitely got a good video recording out of it, which I was pretty pleased with. File size is a little bit larger than I expected, so I'm going to be playing around with that tonight when I do the, the video encode to get the file size down to a more manageable um, size. Uh, considering the, uh, especially considering the, uh, uh, whoa, what's going on with the, oh no, don't crash, don't crash. So I'm hoping, yeah, it's still running. Boy, oh boy, that's that's not good. Just had the uh, big hiccup on the uh, on the board there. So um, don't know what's going on. That that uh, that does not look good. And of course. Well, I hope all the recordings are good. We'll see at the end of the show. But ah, I see what happened was here. For some reason, Norton decided it wanted to kick in. Ah, don't you hate that? I know I, I, it drives me crazy when that kind of stuff happens. But uh, I think there's going to be a little bit of a hole in the uh, in the audio recording here. So, um, eh, that's life. That's what happens. But uh, what's going on with this one, too? There, that's working as well. Jeez. When it rains, it pours. All right. Hey, as you guys know, you know, peace of mind sometimes comes at a price. And I have peace of mind for the security of my home through having a fantastic security system. You know, who's watching your home when you're not home? Who is watching over you when you're home alone? Uh, or who's watching you when you're home alone? Or your kids are... Um, you know, basically latch key, and they're coming in after school and, and locking the door. You know, there's a lot of loonies out there today. And, you know, I've already shared with you guys some incidents that have happened around my house. And I even remember as a kid having some incidents happen when I was a kid living in the country, having people try to come in and break into the house while my sister and I were there. I guess the only difference was back then was that uh, if they had come through the door, the 20-gauge shotgun that I was carrying... <laughs> <laughs> probably would have been uh, sufficient to um, deter whatever was going to happen. But uh, the majority of us probably do not have uh, a shotgun at hand in our homes to uh, to protect the property when needed. But I'm going to tell you, uh, the folks at ADT, who are a leader in home security, have great tools. They have a great service. They have great monitoring, excellent response time, and we've got a deal for you. So help protect your home with a security system monitored by ADT, the leader in home security. Just call Protect Your Home, an authorized dealer of ADT, and you can get an $850 worth of equipment and activation for free. All you got to do is pick up that telephone and dial 1-866-778-3127. That's 1-866-778. 778-3127. This offer is going to go away pretty soon, folks, so you need to get on the ball and give ADT a call. You like that? That kind of rhymed, didn't it? So ADT, again, is the number one monitoring service in the country. Of course, it comes with the world-famous ADT yard signs. Monitoring charges started just about a buck a day, which, of course, is probably less than your spell spelling, uh, spending, not spelling, spending on your latte. And, um, you know, that's peace of mind for your family and your possessions. And you can save up to 20% on your homeowner's insurance policy. The best thing is you make your house a much harder target. You know, a crook's going to go by and you say, oh, man, they got ADT security. There's no way I'm going to hit that house. Let me go hit the neighbor who doesn't have a security system. 
and where I can get in and get out and uh, not have to worry about tripping an alarm. And it just makes yourself uh, much more protected. As a disclaimer here, there is a $99 installation charge, 36-month monitoring agreement between from a price between $35 and $99 per month. Call for terms and conditions and, of course, the license number for the folks at Protect Your Home. Again, an authorized ADT dealer. All right, let me go ahead here and get into the uh, the content and uh, got a stack of stuff for you, uh, as always. And uh, lots of news tonight. I actually had to uh, kind of, I guess for a better word, uh, not go through as much stuff. I actually had to kind of whittle down the list today. I'm closing a few windows here to give some resources back to the uh, the LPC so it uh, wants to cooperate a little better with me. So hopefully we don't get any caching like we did a few minutes ago. But uh, load Chrome up here. And uh, got a, for those of you that are in the UK, got a real easy contest for you, okay? I'm going to have a link up in the show notes. You get a free, be in the running for a free GData antivirus package. Um, GDAT has kindly supplied a copy of their Antivirus 2012 given away to Geek New Central listeners in the UK. So uh, our, our writer Andrew reviewed the app. He's got a good write-up on the application. But uh, he arranged this, so Andrew's got this available for a lucky UK listener or reader. So get over to Geek New Central. I have that link up in the show notes for you. And to get a chance to, uh, to pick up a free antivirus application from the folks at, uh, at GData. All right, uh, moving on here, let's talk about some really big news, and this is uh, pretty shocking in itself. And, we, we, you know, I'm, folks, we're going to have to really get active here. Big content, ISPs, the MPAA, and the RIAA are nearing agreement on a piracy crackdown system in the United States. CNET reported that United States ISPs and top content providers are closer than ever to a regimen for punishing ISP subscribers who engage in illegal file sharing. The story portrays that AT&T, Comcast, Verizon, the Recording Industry Social America, MPAA, are key negotiators with the White House also involved in the discussions. There are confirmations that these discussions are going on. And what this is going to do is without a law in place, your Internet service providers are going to voluntarily provide some harsh treatment to anyone that's using peer-to-peer -peer services on their networks. According to the report, ISPs are going to be taking a graduated response to repeat copyright infringers. First, you would receive a written warning from your internet service provider called a copyright alert. And should sub subsequent messages fail to dissuade your behavior, a menu, like this, a menu of harsher messages could be metered out. They include throttling your bandwidth, limiting your access to websites. Can you believe this? They're going to limit or filter or censor you from accessing only the top 200 websites in the world until you stop the behavior? Or number three, they're going to require subscribers to, yes, require you to participate in the educational program on copyright that you will have to pay for in order to get your access to the Internet back. Finally, they will terminate Internet access. Oh, they say terminate Internet access is not being considered. Wow. The cost of the agreement will be shared by the ISPs and content providers. This is pretty interesting what's being developed here. They're going to come after all of you. They're doing any type of peer-to-peer -peer work, and they are going to bludgeon you. This is with no law. This is with no legislative oversight. This is just an agreement between the content creators, the RIAA, and the Internet the largest internet ISPs. If this doesn't scare you or make you say, what the heck is going on, nothing will. So, you know, the White House released its wish list of intellectual property law changes earlier this year. 
the document said little about web censorship and or a three strike rule. And previous statements also balked at government involvement. But it appears that the administration, the current administration, is looking to encourage the private sector to implement these sorts of provisions on their own. So we'll have to watch this. If something comes out of these talks, we're going to have to watch what goes on. I'm deeply concerned. I'm deeply troubled by this. And they are going to essentially criminate you, make you a criminal. Okay, guess criminate, is that a word? Make you a criminal by using peer-to-peer. And uh, they're going to invoke a lot of stuff that's being done in the UK already, in other countries, in Australia, with three-strike rules. So again, they may make you pay to participate in an educational program on copyright infringement. They could limit your access to websites. They could throttle your internet service connection and send you letters of cease and desist. So this is all over the net today. This was on ours. This was on CNET. This was on Gizmodo. It was on Engadget. It was everywhere. Uh, definitely the talk of the day. But uh, they are definitely looking to crack down in any of you. They're doing any type of piracy. And not only to mention that, to top that off, the big content providers are pressuring Hulu. Even if you're paying for Hulu, they're pressuring Hulu to make you confirm that you are a cable subscriber in order to get access to content that's run the day after it's been released. So Hulu now is being pressured by content creators to essentially say, hey, uh, if you're not uh, paying $150 a month to your cable provider to get access to this uh, stuff via normal television, uh, we're going to shut you down and you're not going to be able to watch uh, day-old releases even if you're a paying customer of Hulu. So the big media is looking to regain control, and they're looking to put all of us in a box that they know they're going to squeeze every, le every single cent they can out of you. Now, I had to laugh because here I am in, uh, in the D.C. area, and in Maryland you can play the Powerball. So I bought uh, – I never get to buy lottery tickets, so I bought – 10 Powerball tickets, and I tell you, I did one of these quick pick things. Of course, in Hawaii, we don't have a lottery at all, and nothing whatsoever. So I, I did uh, I did 10 quick picks, 10 bucks, figuring, you know, if nothing else, I uh, I can, uh, you know, hit the big one here and, and uh, pay off my house and everything else. But, um, you know, <laughs> of these 10, 10 uh, uh, lottery tickets, I did not get a single number. That was in any, I mean, so you have what's one, two, three, four, five, six numbers on each of the uh, lottery tickets. So that was 60 chances to at least get one number right. I did not get a single number from the Powerball on Wednesday night. So <laughs> there was $10. Might as well take these and uh, use them in the bathroom, you know, because, uh, you know, every once in a while you get one number or two numbers right. Um so there's conspiracy all afoot, folks, and uh, I don't think I'll be playing Powerball anytime soon. So I could see where you could become quite addicted to buying uh, buying lottery tickets, but uh, luckily I don't get into states all too often that have them. I guess when I do, I usually play maybe one time, but uh, I just had to laugh at this one. At least here, you know, I'm looking at the numbers, you know, real close, and nothing match. So, oh well. <laughs> hey, NASA today. Uh, wow, they made some big uh, made a big accomplishment. A new a new NASA robot has hovered autonomously, um, and basically it, it it took off. It moved to a certain area. It landed. Uh, man, they have some pretty cool stuff with this. Um, the video about a minute and a half video. You'll have to check it out. When I was trying to load, it took forever to queue. Must be a lot of people are um, are doing that. But of course, what NASA is really looking to do is develop uh, robotic landers that once they land and drop a cargo can take off again and move a little bit to a different area, drop again and, and drop off more cargo. But uh, this particular uh, lander flew about uh, for about 27 seconds, and uh, but it did this remotely. It did it uh, by itself uh, with remote control. So they're pretty success they were pretty su uh, excited about the success. And I'm kind of surprised it's taken them this long to you know, have one that would autonomously take off and land 
Seems like that would be a lot easier than what it uh, what it appears to be, but I guess not. Now, not only are the RAAA and PAA working with ISPs, the MPAA has spent, now check this out, according to disclosure reports, the MPAA spent $400,000 lobbying a wide range of U.S. government departments in the first quarter of 2011. So that's four hundred k in the first quarter. That's money that they've uh, gotten from some of these settlements. And, but who did they lobby? The FBI, Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, ICE, and the Vice President's office, office. Issues on the table included so-called rogue sites, including rapid share, streaming graduated response, three strikes, and domain seizures. So how can, you know, they're not going in lobbying congressional leaders. They're going in and lobbying against governmental employees that work at the FBI, Department of Justice, Homeland Security. How can they be allowed to do that? How can they be allowed to come in and and push agenda on governmental departments, take away from those departments' daily workload to come in and talk to them and get them involved in trying to shut down websites and have ICE secured, you know, uh, seize domain names that they want them to seize? It sounds like collusion to me. I, I don't get it. I understand the the um, going into congressional offices and lobbying and and trying to to buy off senators and House of Representative members to to pass legislation to make it harder for people to you know tighten up copyright laws. But why are they spending a ton of money? And why how can they spend a ton of money lobbying law enforcement agencies? You really don't think about them doing this. You think about him talking to politicians. This is amazing. And I think basically you're going into a government office and you're going to be discussing all those discussions should be recorded and put in a public domain. There should not be allowed to have a private, you know, if it's of a law enforcement nature and it's been initiated by the FBI or someone like that, there's those rules don't apply. But if you're going to go in and you're going to lobby an active U.S. government organization, should not those meetings and the topics of those meetings and the recordings of those meetings be made public? I don't get it. How many of you just, how many of you just are completely blown away by this? Anyway, I'd love to hear your comments. Geeknews at gmail.com. Voicemail hotline, of course, is 619 342 Six, five. And I'm going to share with you guys at the end of the show how PR folks are uh, targeting my voicemail line. You guys will get a laugh out of that. Hey, let's talk about the ACTA just a little bit. Um, apparently, the Mexican Congress opposing ACTA uh, had went to the full Congress today, and basically they put a bill forward that basically said, we do not support the ACTA, trying to pr uh, pressure the uh, the Mexican executive um group or executive office to not sign the ACTA um, agreement and uh, I guess that passed but we'll see what happens with the uh, with the uh, executive branch in the Mexican government whether or not they actually sign the ACTA or not but the Mexican Congress said no so this is the first time I've heard of a, a congressional group stand up and and say no now how many times do you get a phone call and you get the voicemails like unknown or you you pick it up and it's it's a different number than what you think should be but the FC's adopted new rules today that was would increase the penalties for individuals and organizations that alter their caller ID information to commit fraud or other harmful intent the FCC rule now finds violators ten thousand dollars per violation plus more every day it continues uh, users can still change your caller ID as long as it's not for for fraud or harmful purposes, okay? So uh, that's kind of a curious spin here. There's a good article over on digitaltrends.com talking about how 90% of companies have been hacked. This is huge. A new survey shows that business is vastly underfund cybersecurity measures, which has led to massive surge in computer breaches. 90% of businesses have been hacked the past year, according to a survey of 583 U.S. companies sponsored by Juniper Networks. A full 59% of IT professionals interviewed for the survey reported they had been hacked two or more times, with 9% saying they had endured at least five network intrusions in the past 12 months. That's huge. 
That's huge. They said the study found the lack of funding of proper cybersecurity measures was primarily a factor in the prevalence of hacks, with 52% saying that only 10% or less of their department's budget was dedicated to security alone. Um, it's tough times out there right now, so I understand where dollars have to be spent. But um, apparently this um, survey was done uh, with companies of more than 5,000 employees. So if, if you have a company that's that large and you have smaller companies that are not getting surveyed, they probably have nowhere near the security budget, um, I'm sure the number is going to get much higher. That's just kind of scary, isn't it? Or do you still sell stuff on eBay? Well, eBay is going to raise fees for private buy it now listings. If you list stuff on eBay, I hate those listings. I really do the buy it now ones. They're never competitively priced. You can usually go on e on, um, on Amazon or other sites and get them cheaper. I'd rather still bid on stuff that's out there. But eBay is introducing a flat 10% fee for private sellers using its buy it now fixed price listing. Uh, starting next month. So if you've been selling stuff on there, it's going to cost you ten, uh, $10. And the new fees are going to be capped at, it looks like, uh, about $40 per, transa per transaction and will be uh, implemented on the 21st of July. How long has it been since you bought something from eBay? And I, I buy stuff on there from time to time. I look for deals. Well, the, f the two twins that were in this illegal, uh, illegal battle with Facebook, they have uh, dropped all challenges and uh, appeals, and they're going to get their $65 million settlement from Facebook that was awarded to them in 2008. And I guess they're going to have to go home and sob in their, uh, their pile of cash that they have received anyway. So uh, $65 million and the, uh, the twins are now uh, uh, basically uh, done in this chapter of the Facebook uh, uh, saga. All right, oh, in the UK, the European Space Agency is pressing hard with a new re-entry vehicle. It's known as the IXV. It kind of sounds kind of very sexy, does it? doesn't it? It's expected to launch in 2013. And it's a distinctive wedge vehicle. It will be put in an altitude of 400 kilometers and then re-entered. But it's uh, basically, it looks just kind of like a shoe almost. And they're going to be testing that and see if they can uh, develop a new uh, fast turnaround basically vehicle that they can haul supplies and then um, re-enter atmosphere and so forth. But uh, uh, the experimental vehicles is a car-sized two-home automated craft, two-ton, excuse me, <laughs> that can uh, be seen as a follow-on to the advanced re-entry demonstrator that was uh, flown in 1998. So um, not very big, carry a small payload, but a pretty quick turnaround and cheap to get to, uh, to, get to orbit. The um, Christopher Penn, he's a friend of mine, and uh, he wrote a pretty good article on his website, uh, ChristopherPenn.com. He wrote an article about how social media now directly influences search results or search rankings. And there was an article over on SEO MOZ, which was, has taken the SEO community by storm. And they highlighted that Google search results are now being adjusted on a per person basis. Uh, depending on your social connection. So um, all of you that follow me on Twitter or follow me on Facebook, um, I'm more inclined that when I go to Google and I do a search, that if you have a website or a product or a service or a comment that has been related to something I am searching on and that you have linked to or, or clicked on, I will be more inclined to get the results that you chose. So essentially what we're doing here is, be t is as long as you have a network of people that you trust, you're going to be starting to be fed search results based upon what your friends are doing. It's going to be closer to tying us together. So essentially what this really sets up is a numbers game. Um, influencers who have large social networks are going to be spending, uh, not have to really necessarily spending word of mouth, they're now going to be causing search engine adjustments. So in other words, you may be finding my site at the top of the search results instead of at number two or number three. Um, the number one ranking for keywords is less meaningful now because if, if they're going to adjust search results based upon who we're all connected to, it's going to be amazing. Um, if you're marketing someone, now there's a direct motive to build your network as large as possible among your prospective customers in order to influence that search result so that they find you. Um, 
so this is this is very very interesting now he goes on to say in his final comments here that while there's no direct evidence that the content around a socially shared link matters it's still not a bad idea to give it some context both for your followers and possible contextual association here's an example of two tweets he says check out my new blog post at blue sky factory and HTTT blog blue sky if so versus check out my new email marketing post on blue sky factory with the with a link so he's basically now by using associated keywords in his Twitters he's going to be driving uh, more traffic through the Google ecosphere back to his website it's a good article by Chris Penn and what do you guys think about Google giving you search results based upon your social media influence and or those that you connect to kind of a interesting development I know Facebook is already kind of doing some of this stuff as well remember MySpace yeah they're still around but the folks over at Bloomberg Businessweek wrote a great uh, multi-piece article that just oh if you're an employee of Facebook, you do not want to read this article. Or if you're a fan a still of Facebook, oh my goodness. Um, how much time do we give Facebook? How much time does Facebook have left? Do they have a year, two years? Can they turn it around? Um, I, I was never a user of Facebook. I had a count over there. I think I still do, but it's been, what, two, three, four years since I probably even logged on. Um, you know, it once promised to redefine music, uh, politics, dating, pop culture who's doing that now Facebook right so I think they ate their lunch uh, is Facebook have a ch or is MySpace have a chance of ever recovering I don't think so now here's another f uh, article on advertising enhanced by the power of your network the folks at LinkedIn they're getting in this game too so here's what they're going to be doing is if you go on LinkedIn and I uh, let's say as, as a com at raw voice I am advertising for a uh, let's say for um, a social media manager what they're going to do is they are going to link my ad to those of you that I know um, and they're going to basically um, any of you that work in social so okay how's this? let me explain this a little better um, it, okay um, if you have a rec if you're recruiting it's easy for a job seeker to um, get recommendations by people he knows when he's going to apply for a job so let's say you, if you're going to want to go apply at Google for a job and you got some friends that work at Google well the ad is basically going to have the Google um, uh, job announcement in it and at the bottom it's going to have people at Google that can recommend you or people that you know that can recommend you for this job at Google that's one way they're going to do it another thing they're going to do is like um, if I'm following Vistaprint and of course I use Vistaprint for all my business card needs they're cheap they're fast they're expensive the cards turn out good um, it's just they've got a great website you know here I am giving you a personal endorsement for Vistaprint but if I'm following Vistaprint on LinkedIn and you come in to the LinkedIn website they're gonna serve you an ad for Vistaprint that's gonna show me as a person that's connected with Vistaprint and give you confidence to go ahead and try that product so pretty cool stuff here so they've created a new layer of personalized content and ads um, and they're saying with your privacy and trust in mind whatever um, but this is kind of an interesting development what they're doing over at LinkedIn so basically what they're trying to do is make you feel more confident that I like Vistaprint and if you see my face on the ad you're gonna say oh yeah Todd likes Vistaprint so I trust Todd so let me go ahead and, and use uh, them as a service for a business card very inexpensive way to get very effective click-through rates on advertising um, how do we do that in podcasting how do we make those of you that are supportive of a company let's say you know this audience is very large how do I figure out what you guys like and when I'm basically looking for stuff how do I figure out 
your, you know, how can we reverse this and work it the other way? That's kind of an interesting idea. I don't know exactly how we would do this, but uh, LinkedIn has all this, you know, all this extra data of groups that you've joined and so forth. So pretty cool what they're doing. But uh, again, it's all ads are being enhanced by the power of the people that you know and the recommendations they make. Go at a restaurant, you recommend a restaurant, you get in a city that has that restaurant, they're going to give you an ad, and you say, hey, Todd likes that restaurant. Todd's your buddy. You know, he's given a positive recommendation. You know, maybe my face is on the ad as well. Some interesting developments there, isn't it? Now, Twitter, on the other hand, they're getting ready to uh, start uh, introducing advertising among the short messages that users see and the most active part of the social networking service. And the move comes as Twitter looks for a wider variety of uh, revenue markets. So what they're going to do is to place promoted tweets in the mainstream of tweets on the service, and they're going to be putting additional ads actually in the stream that you see. So we will see how this works out. I'm see if people will revolt to this or not. Right, let me check the time here, see how we're doing. We're doing okay on time. Good. Well, the FBI did a raid on a digital hosting company called Digital One. They're a Swiss company that had servers in the United States, and the FBI went in and just emptied a rack of servers looking for someone. At the same time, they took down the Instapaper uh, website. They took one of their eight servers. They weren't the target of the uh, seizure, but uh, basically the Instapaper folks uh, had to recover from this uh, server being seized, but uh, there was other sites being served on it as well. So apparently the folks at... Uh, the FBI were after someone, and there's a lot of rumor about who they're after, and it's probably some of these hacking groups. But um, they basically, uh, every, you know, everyone else's server was residing on there as well. Geek News Central is on its own server. It's in its own box. I have a dedicated box. There's, I'm not sharing it with other people. At least I don't think I am. And, uh, but uh, very interesting to see what happened there. But they're back up online. Hey, uh, you know, we've talked about NFC, the, which is near field communications, and we talked about it some day soon being able to pay for a soda, groceries, or whatever, dinner with our cell phones by placing it on a near field uh, communication sensor. Google is doing tests in Japan. Of course, NFC has been in Japan for a long time, uh, but they're doing a trial in central Tokyo with Android phones. And basically what this is is, because there are 70 million phones in Japan that support NFC, uh, they are basically working with merchants there to do some tests, and they're basically they're probably testing to see how they're going to roll this out here in the United States. Google has already implied that uh, they have plans to distribute as many as 8 million NFC devices to merchants here in the United States uh, in a very short order. So... Um, you see your Android phone coming at you may have some sort of near field communication support. It would be big. It would be really, really big. Well, um, Apple has been given uh, approval to bid for Nortel's assets in bankruptcy. Of course, Nortel is in, uh, in, uh, in bankruptcy court. But the antitrust division, the antitrust division of the Justice Department's reviewed to request a bid for a number of Nortel patents. And they've been given approval to move forward with that. And uh, we'll see what uh, what they end up buying. But they're looking to spend a bunch of money buying up different things. We've talked about Apple TV before and how it's been such a disappointment in it not being able to do apps and have widgets and different types of things that you would expect them to have done already considering their success with the App Store. Well, Apple has introduced an, an enhanced TV widget that they've gotten patent approval for HDTV. On the 23rd of June, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office published a patent application patent that reveals what I think is going to be the next chapter for Apple TV. And the menu system looks pretty familiar. You basically have a little pop-up menu that would come along the bottom of your screen. But it appears, and rumors are that there's going to be a new Apple TV in the fall, that this may be introduced with... Uh, with the next upcoming version of the, or the next version of Apple TV. It would be an interactive um, widget. Now, the way they've got it laid out is across the top, you see movie themes. Next line down is basically a layered type of widget where if you click on it, it kind of opens up 
for information, computer, iPhone, TV, and then below that would be a list of different widgets and stuff. So you'd be able to scroll down and select stuff. Um, if you look at the, the patent and you look at the figures, it's pretty easy to see where they're going and what we can expect from, uh, from Apple. And I'm pretty excited if they decide to build widgets and let us design stuff into the Apple TV, which I'm still wondering if they'll ever open that ecosystem up. Uh, time will definitely tell, but uh, pretty cool stuff uh, being announced from Apple. Hey, the uh, CEO of uh, Netflix has uh, been asked to join the uh, the board of directors at Facebook, and this is uh, definitely an interesting development here. Um, but uh, you know, bringing on the Netflix CEO is a big, big move. And bringing him on to the board of directors means that obviously Facebook is working very close with Netflix. So time will tell here. You know, Facebook could buy Netflix. Would that be would that be a move in itself? It'd be pretty uh, pretty good. Hey, those of you that are on T-Mobile, you know, a million of you have uh, jailbroke and are running T-Mobile Sims in your uh, in your Apple phones or in your I in your iPhones. Pretty cool stuff. T-Mobile says they have 1 million iPhone users on their network. Wow. That's uh, that's pretty good, isn't it? So I guess no matter what microSIM and 3G support, it hasn't mattered. People have been able to, uh, to make it happen. All right, this is for the ladies. And this is an article over at Jezebel.com. The FDA has come out with a semi-new report talking about silicon breast implants. And the report is uh, based on a study that was commissioned uh, by apparently a manufacturer of implants. And that's suspicious right off the bat. You don't want to trust any report from one of those companies. But um, supposedly the data shows the implants are not linked to breast cancer, connected tissue disease, or infertility. But the, the, the numbers are, are quite, uh, quite alarming here. Um, they say 20 to, 20 to 40 percent of women who receive implants for augmentation had a reoperation in the first eight to ten years after getting them, and the figure was 40 to 70 percent for women who got implants for reconstruction, including um, after cancer surgery, which I know is a blessing for women that um, have been, uh, you know, have went through the ravages of, of breast cancer, uh, but. Um, They've t talked about the differences, and you know, there's a. We all know that uh, anything that is uh, not natural that uh, potentially could leak into our bodies is not good. No matter, you know, I, I can't imagine anyone saying that that would be good. But um, the study is is again is we should raise a little bit of a concern for for the ladies out there that have um, some augmentation going on. Uh, be careful. Uh, go ahead and, and link this up to you. You can read the uh, report, and it's on the Wall Street Journal. The studies, again, don't inspire a lot of confidence here uh, based on the tracking and some of the results. So I have the link up in the show notes for you, okay? All right, is human population growth accelerating evolution? We all know that the, the human uh, species has evolved over, you know, many, many thousands of years, and... Uh, what we have seen and what they're seeing now based on studies done uh, with DNA analysis that they've been able to take from uh, people that have died uh, you know, a couple hundred years ago all the way through now, what they're seeing is, is that in the past 5,000 years alone, there has been a, I guess, an evolution rate 100 times higher than any other period of, of, of human evolution. Now, I think if you really think about it, we've come a long way, baby, you know, in, in, in those number of years. But um, but it's, it's, it's a sign, though, they say, that um, they actually, scientists are actually kind of pleased with because of the changing environment. It says that the human uh, DNA structure and the human uh, species is quite adaptable, being able to, to adapt and change as, as the environment does. Um, not to say that, uh, you know, everything is, is hunky-dory, just don't get me wrong here, but uh, a lot of resistance to different types of diseases have, um, over the years, the bodies have become more resistant to stuff and mortality rates are, are lower, but um, 
it's uh, it's interesting where the uh, where this is all taking us, and with them having now mapped the human the human basically uh, DNA structure, uh, we're at a point now where science could get pretty uh, tricky with uh, playing with our with our genes and our, our DNA infrastructure for sure. So uh, we'll see where this takes us. Hey, over in the Daily Galaxy at dailygalaxy.com, they say that there are 2 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way alone. And um, the story is really quite, you go, whoa, 2 billion, that's a big number. But um, they feel that because of uh, where we are in, you know, basically in, the, in, the, in space, and um, they're thinking, you know, we are probably just like ants on a molehill. And there's all kinds of, you know, s analogies that they can use. But uh, this new study is um, um, pretty impressive where they've been able to map different uh, potential planets and so forth and uh, sun positions and everything else. But they feel that uh, there could be as many as 2 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way. That has to be somebody out there for sure. Now, speaking of aliens, the SETI organization is raising money. Uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence has really suffered a big blow in April when the, uh, the uh, basically funding was shut down uh, through lack of funds. And uh, so what they're doing now is they're doing fundraising efforts to, uh, to really kickstart the organization. They're looking to raise $200,000. As of this writing, nearly $30,000 has been raised already. And um, but they're trying to raise money so they can get back in the game here in in a big way. But two hundred grand, you know, as many of us out here that are geeks, you know, we each give five bucks. Uh, you know, it should get them back uh, back in action at the uh, the SETI organization. What do you guys think? Do you think they deserve it? Do you think we should donate money to them? Is it a worthwhile place to uh, donate a few hard dollars? Love to hear your feedback. Geeknews at gmail.com. Voicemail hotline six one nine. Three four two seven three six five. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we saw a lot of arrest in several European countries that uh, took out a lot of peer-to-peer -peer websites. And the folks over at Torrent Freak are reporting on one of those websites where a file hoster has returned with its guns blazing. Uh, while the site itself hasn't come back out, they are redirecting all of its traffic to a new file hosting site. Um, that has, in just the past week, received up to 2 million hits a day. Um, this is huge. Now, the site that went down was uh, from one of the raids was called Ducklow.com. It was a cyber locker site that had 400 servers worth more than $2 million. Those servers were seized. But instead of lying low, the people behind the site quickly redirected the Ducklow.com domain to video. 2k.tv now I will say this I got an email uh, this past weekend um, that told me Todd search for this app on the app store load it up and check it out now it came from a trusted source and I loaded it up and it was not in English all the sub everything was uh, written in Chinese all of the characters so I kind of had to even my wife was like, I don't know what that is. This one's weird. She could read some of the kanji, but all of it didn't quite cross. And we, we played with this app for a little while. Wow. Apple does not know about this one. It is a definitely, because I basically, we rolled through, and she says, that looks like such and such movie. And I click play, and all, although it was subtitled, it was in, in, a, in Chinese and subtitled in English, uh, no, excuse me. It was in English, subtitled in Chinese. We were shocked. And it was a movie that wasn't too old, yet the app was available on the App Store. And I'm just wondering if there is a lot of apps out there hiding that, for a better word, has slipped underneath the noses of Apple. Um, and I don't even want to say the name of it on the show. I really don't. Um, we haven't, I, we only tested it that one time and I emailed my buddy back and said, whoa, he says, he, he says, this one's not going to be along around too long, but just like this site here, video2k.tv, um, this site probably isn't going to be along very well either, but you, I'm looking at the movie lineup on this as, you know, kind of wide eyeballs here because, uh, it is definitely, um, 
not a legal site. But they say that they're ready to rock and roll. they got servers in different locations around the world. And that they are going to, uh, if they get raided in one place, they're going to switch to a new one. And they got 50 domains in case the current ones become target of seizures. So they will definitely be under uh, under attack here soon by the, by the uh, by the Fed. So be careful out there using any of these sites and uh, basically getting access to content that you know is not uh, um, is not really supposed to be out there. So so be careful. The folks at UTorrent have released a new version of software that if you're using that on a website on a peer to peer website. You don't have to wait for a video or a music file to completely download. It actually starts playing almost immediately. So the uTorrent has been updated, even though they've been recently sued. So we'll see where that develops. The folks over at Pogo Plug, and I'm a big fan of Pogo Plug. I have several. a matter of fact, I have I've given Pogo Plugs out on this show. Um, I've used a Pogo Plug uh, in, my, in my office. I have access to it here from my computer here. But Pogo Plug has gone software only. And for twenty nine ninety nine, you can get a pro version of uh, for twenty nine dollars. You get a, a pro version of Pogo Plug, or you can download a free version, and um, so it allows you to watch your content all across the web, and you can put music, video, files, uh, whatever you want on the device, and then when you hit it, it pulls it from your local uh, connection at home. But uh, $29 per Pogo Plug account, and you can run it on as many computers as you want. And uh, it's in the cloud. Basically, you run it as, as software on your desktop. You don't actually have to have it uh, running through a device. So kind of interesting move here by, by Pogo Plug. Hey, according to SiteOrg and a lot of other sites, Google is facing wide-ranging U.S. antitrust probe. It appears the U.S. FTC is poised on opening a formal antitrust probe into whether the Internet search giant Google has abused its dominance on the web. You know, did we expect this not to come? Google has become the 25,000-pound gorilla, and, you know, when companies get this big, they get become under the watchful eye of the Department of Justice. And I'm sure at some point here, Google will be in the midst of a major FTC uh, probe and digging into the business model of F of Google. Boy, I sure hope they've dotted their I's and crossed their T's because, uh, you know, it took Microsoft like 10 or 12 years to finally get underneath the watchful eye of the Department of Justice with a lot of pain, uh, splitting up of assets, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff. So we'll see where this goes with Google. And you knew this was going to happen at some point. The bigger they are, um, the bigger, really, the bigger they are, the bigger the target they become. I have to agree with John C. Dvorak, and I don't do that very often, but he put an uh, article up on PCMag.com talking about redundant posts are ruining uh, social media. I try to be very, very careful where I post uh, any type of content. If I post it on Twitter, I want it to be a post that stays on Twitter that points to something I've written that's its original. If I post something on Facebook, I don't want it m making its way back into other ecospheres. So I really don't allow a lot of my apps to repost something I'm posting on a specific site. And the reason for that is, is because Google starts to punish you when you have, okay, let's say I do something on Foursquare, and I do a recommendation, and it tweets it out, and it also sends it over to Facebook. So now when Google comes through and does the indexing, they see this on Twitter, they see it on Facebook, they see it on Foursquare, and they say, okay, which of these is right? And who's the source document? And, the, where do, and then usually you just end up getting shoved down into a deep pit and the, and the data is never, ever found. So be careful out there what you're allowing to get cross-posted where. And I believe here that um, redundant posts are definitely ruining a social media, you know, Set your divisions, where you're going to post stuff, and when. And I think it'll help you out a lot. So link will be up in the show notes on this. You can you can check out the article by uh, John C. Dvorak. Thunderbird 5.0 is out. So the Beta 2 has arrived. Matter of fact, it uh, updated on my computer when I uh, came back in from meetings today. Uh, Firefox version 6, is it, is out as well. So that has updated. So uh, be aware of the new version of, of Firefox being online and available. 
There's some rumor control coming out of the Google TV space as well that they're working on their next version of Google TV 2.0 and have started to uh, make certain partners available to build uh, applications. Here's the thing that really is going to upset me. Google TV pro or Google promised a release of the API this year. They said they were going to open it up, make it public, let people develop to it. But apparently they're building new devices and they're giving them to select partners to let them start working on the next iteration of the Google TV platform. If they don't open this up, I'm going to be just, uh, I'm, well, I'll be upset and crushed at the same time. But apparently the new Google TV device, it's a, it's, it's, there's going into the code word of fish tank, uh, which is a development hardware is got an antenna on it. So if you buy the device, you can plug an antenna into it. So it may have a TV tuner. So this may be the first real attack against uh, the cable companies and maybe those of you that have been thinking about cutting the cord. So we'll see where this happens and if Google TV 2.0 embraces cord cutters, good there, but I want access to that uh, development system. That's what I want. That's the juicy stuff. All right, um, moving on here. Hulu's got an uh, app that's on Android, so Hulu Plus is available on the, in the Android Marketplace, so be, available, be aware of that. Here's an interesting one, and this is over on IndieMedia.org. This is a, um, I believe, out of Rochester, New York. On Thursday, actually this happened a couple of months ago, an officer... Um, basically arrested a woman in her front yard. She was standing in her front yard while she recorded a suspicious traffic stop in front of her house. What was going on was the police officer had stopped a vehicle uh, with a young black male in it, and she had came out on the lawn to film the traffic stop. And uh, basically she thought that the police was uh, being, a, you know, that made what was going on maybe a little over the top. So she basically broke out her camera and uh, started filming it. And uh, there shortly directly afterwards, the police came on to her front lawn and arrested her. So there is a, um, you know, here she is on her own property filming someone off her property, even though it was the police in a traffic stop. She's filming that. And they come on her private property and arrest her for taking a video. Now, I don't know about you guys. This is shocking to think that someone could be arrested for filming in their own property, of their own home, on their own yard... The woman was charged with obstructing governmental administration. She was bailed out of a jail, and she's awaiting her next hearing, which happens on June 27th in Rochester City Court. There's a YouTube video of this incident available via this website. But there's something seriously wrong, folks, when we cannot go out in our own front yards and videotape activities that are happening in the public arena, on public streets, and, not, and get arrested for doing so. What is up with that? Are we now in a police state? Are police that sensitive to being filmed? Heck, they got their own cameras on. They got cameras in their cars. They got these little head, ca you know, these little head cam things that they use. So you know, you're gonna stop by a police officer. You're gonna be on film by them. She wasn't even. She wasn't even in the street. She was on her own private property. Hmm. It's really going to make you go, hmm, doesn't it? And really, you just wonder where we're, where we're headed here. Okay, Chrome 13 introduced experimental hidden nav bar option. Kind of cool. You know, they've been trying to get rid of the navigation bar for a long time. But Chrome 13 basically has the ability to, to have a little pop down. You can put the web address in, and it'll pop up and hide itself. 
So this is a pretty cool little new feature, and Chrome's, I think, is onto something with this one. So I'll have the link up in the show notes on that. Excuse me, it was Firefox 5.0 that's been officially released. So that's out on the street. They promised to have these rapid response, rapid releases. So probably by Christmas we'll be on Firefox 22. But anyway, Firefox 5.0 is up online and available. Over on Lifehacker, they're reporting how Netflix now is giving you the ability to set your, uh, basically, the bandwidth setting. And you can do you can set three video quality to help manage your data usage. Um, number one, you can set good quality. That's up to 0.3 gigs per hour. Better quality, up to 0.7 gigs per hour. And best quality, where you can get up to 1 gig per hour or up to 2.3 gigs per hour for HD. So if you're trying to avoid hitting your data caps on uh, Netflix, uh, they've got this now set up so that you can uh, set this setting. So this is pretty smart by them. Adaptive streaming is what they call it. Google TV, if you're a Sage TV user, um, I know I've gotten some comments from you. Some of you that are Sage TV um, users. I'm not going to go through this full article, but they've got a questions and answers uh, for basically designed for those of you that are customers. I want you want so that you have some uh, reassurance post Google to know what's going to happen. I'll have the link up in the show notes for you there. He wanted to definitely point out a article by KL. Um, he is involved in the music beta by Google and uh, so he's been playing with uh, with uh, Google Music and if you want to see how that works and how stuff gets uploaded into the cloud and everything they've done and what he couldn't upload and what he could um, anyway have that link up in the show notes you definitely want to check that out that's one of the uh, heavy hitting articles right now at, at geeknewscentral.com a lot of uh, little short stories here too for you tonight. Uh, Nevada is preparing for its uh, eminent rise of driverless cars. The uh, state of Nevada has uh, directed their Department of Transportation to come up with rules and safety uh, standards for vehicles that can drive themselves in anticipation of that uh, features coming soon. Viacom has sued Cablevision over its uh, TV streaming uh, optimum for iPad app. Uh, apparently Viacom is not happy about... Uh, the uh, the ability of them to uh, for uh, Cablevision to be able to stream stuff. This was after Viacom quit fighting with Time Warner today, but uh, so anyway, must be Viacom got what they want out of Time Warner. So now they're going after Cablevision after probably a settlement. Can you imagine having a vehicle that does 1,325 miles to the gallon? Well, apparently they've uh, someone's developed one, and uh, in Russia they've they basically have decided to let a 11 year old student. Uh, drive this vehicle and uh, to prove that it can get 1,325 miles on a single gallon of, of diesel and uh, this thing looks more like a go-kart than a than a, any true vehicle but the 11 year old gets to drive 1,325 miles on a track we'll see if he can do it without wrecking but uh, this thing is so light uh, that uh, this is their goal but uh, time will tell if they succeed with this if you uh, Want to know how old someone really is? Next time you go have a cocktail or go over to someone's house, uh, just you know, steal the glass that they've been drinking from because there's a new saliva test that will reveal a person's approximate age. So they can get it within a couple of years. And uh, so basically they uh, get a little saliva and they can tell exactly how old you are. So fellas and ladies, if you've been lying about your age and don't want anyone to know, uh, just a little bit of saliva may pr may uh, basically dime you out. Now imagine, you know, in Japan, they're real big. They have a lot of pop idols, and uh, they're fan crazy as they are here in the United States. But apparently, um, fans in Japan were pretty surprised that new learned that when they found out that their newest member of the AKB48 band, which is an all-girl idol band. With a rotating roster of fresh teen faces, the newest fan or the newest top girl in that group isn't human. She is a robot. Um, according to the official profile, Amy Iguchi is a 16-year-old from Satyama, north of Tokyo. And uh, she's a robot. She is the newest member of the Japanese pipe idol, idol group AKB48. And you just wonder if they found a girl that could sing but wasn't very pretty, so they substituted a robot. Weird. All I can say is only in Japan. If you live in Wyoming and you work for the state government, you are now in the cloud. The state government has moved all of its 10,000 uh, users into the uh, into the cloud, 
And uh, so Wyoming is the, one of the first states to have moved all of their state employees into, uh, into Google Apps. So this is a pretty big one. All right, folks, that's all I've got for regular content tonight. I do have a couple of uh, emails, and let me go ahead and get into those right now before we get into the voicemails. Um, of course, if you have comments on today's show, geeknews at gmail.com, voicemail hotline 619-342-7365. First email is from Bree. She actually posted an article up on the, or a link up on the Facebook page. And Bree says, um, and basically this is about the public taking a stand against uh, what's going on with the, the folks that are trying to shut down uh, local internet by uh, local uh, utilities and so forth. She says, Bree says, I wholeheartedly agree. I sent information from your podcast about the problem in North Carolina to all my relatives who live there. But other concerns took more precedence for them than to write and call their new, uh, North Carolina reps. I'm still angry at AT&T and any other of the baby bells for promising so much fiber optic to every household if you allow us to impose extra taxes for that. Congress allowed it for many, many years through today's bills, and they still have not delivered on that promise, and we will continue to give them extra dollars. So I think Bree is just as, as uh, upset as I am about uh, you know the, the failure to deliver by uh, these big companies. I'm going to email here from, from Dave, and I'm waiting for the email to load. And he says, uh, Google's acquired Sage TV. I've been a Sage TV user and hobbyist for about seven years. It's by far, best, if, if far, by far the best PBR solution. It's a sad day for most Sage TV customers. Geek Tonic probably has the most news about the acquisition. Here's a link to their story. Thanks, Dave, for that. Got an email here from Brian, and uh, Brian is, uh, of course, a fan of the show, who calls in from time to time with a great commentary. He says, hey, Todd, um, was wondering if you knew if the loops and garage band can be used in a podcast, or is it breaking copyright laws? Also wonder about the Apple fonts, if they can be used on a web page. If you weren't allowed to use either for public use, I don't know why they bother including any of it with the OS. Was just going to Google around for an answer, but I see you on live, so I figured I'd just ask. Sorry, I missed you, Brian, but I think you can. Don't quote me on it. Google it, okay? <laughs> I got an email here from Charles. He said, um, I think this was, did we cover this on the last show? I don't think so. He said, hi, Todd. You mentioned sites being seized for having links to child porn and the like, and I can understand people being arrested and their sites being seized or blocked. Those who do this need to be punished. However, sometimes this might just be a case of the owner not being web savvy. A couple of years ago, I noticed a strange character out of place on a friend's business site. I took a quick look at the source and saw the page after page of hidden links to pirated software in China Korea and other Asian countries that called up the business owner who looked while I was online and he was dumbfounded. His web grew, grew, web grew was called and he knew nothing. The, web, the host provider did not know how of the hack and no one was really sure how long the links had been there. The host provider reported several more sites on their system with similar hidden links for other illicit items. Eventually it was all cleared up <coughs> Excuse me, and, and the backups replaced with new files. The site owner should have been the, uh, the site owner could have been in real trouble with no idea why if he had not stumbled upon a single out-of-place character. Please be diligent, people. He says, I've been listening for six years. You must be doing something right. Keep on going, Todd. Great shows, Charles. Charles, thanks for calling, and thanks for being a true Ohana here at, at Geek News Central. And, yeah, you know, I, I, I have no sympathy for anyone that's doing anything with child porn or the like. Um, if They definitely need the book thrown at them. But, you know, it's just kind of scary. You know, I have to police my website on a regular basis. I check the log files for access. Um, nothing is perfect, but you do have to police your own for sure. All right, that's all I got for um, voicemail comments. I do want to share one. Well, we're almost here out of time. But you know what's happening right now? PR people have gotten my voicemail hotline number at 619-342-7365, and they're pitching me apps. You guys want to hear just a, here's a 27 second one. I'll play this one for you. You guys can listen to it here. Upcoming launch of our post office. Receive emails with a legally recognized receipt. If you'd like a briefing or to schedule an interview with the CEO, please call back. The number is 702 461 1812. Oh, very interesting, yeah? Very interesting there, what's going on. So 
they just basically pitch me via the hotline for an app. Kind of cool. All right, we're already here coming right up against the, the deadline on the one minute and one hour and 15 minutes. I need to roll. Everyone, thanks for hanging out. Of course, geeknews at gmail.com, wastemail hotline 619-342-7365. We'll be back in Honolulu for Monday's show. And thanks for all of you being part of the family here and right, uh, watching and staying subscribed and listening, of course. Comments again, send them to the email address or to the voicemail hotline. Until next time, everyone, take care. And aloha.